went to the August 11th, 2020 um, Special City Council meeting. Um, please let the record reflect that all council members are present or will be very shortly. I see their names or their pictures. Um, so we're going to begin this evening um, with the pledge and Vice Chair Blair has offered to do that for us. So we'll probably uh, put ourselves on mute. Okay, would ask all those council members and all those joining us to please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks so much for that. And then after that, I actually forgot to read the statement I needed to read. So <laughs> there you go. We're starting the night off right. So let me get to that really quick. So this is the council chair determination to hold electronic meetings without anchor location. In accordance with the Utah code 5232074, I have determined that conducting meetings of the Ogden City Council with an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present due to the infectious nature and potentially dangerous health effects of contracting the COVID-19 virus. This determination is based on the following. Utah has been in a declared state of emergency due to the novel coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 since March 6, 2020. The World Health Organization has characterized the spread of COVID-19 as a pandemic. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, has determined that COVID-19 is easily spread between or among people who are in close contact with each other through airborne respiratory droplets and may be spread by people who are non-symptomatic. Federal, state, and local health authorities recommend limiting public gatherings, wearing fa face masks, and following social distancing guidelines. That those exposed to individuals experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 self-quarantine for 14 days, and that individuals experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 self-isolate to prevent and control the continuing spread of COVID-19. Physical distancing measures are difficult to set up and maintain in the city council chambers. Based on the foregoing, all public meetings, including work sessions and meetings of the Redevelopment Agency, will be held electronically through August 31st, 2020. Information on how to connect to the electronic public meetings will be posted on each agenda. The public may comment during the electronic meeting during public hearings or provide public input on items designated for input on the agenda. General public comments will also be taken, taken during regular meetings. Written public comments may also be submitted to the following electronic options. Telephonic message at 801-629-8158, public comment submission form at ogdencity.com forward slash public input, or email at citycouncil at ogdencity.com. This statement was issued and became effective on August 3rd, 2020. Thanks again for your patience with that. Now I'd ask for you to join me in just a moment of silence, please. Thank you all. So first uh, item on our, well, the third item on our agenda is the approval of minutes. And this is uh, the regular meeting of January 28th, 2020. That's council member Heyer. Yes, Chair, I have reviewed those minutes, found them to be accurate. And the joint work session of March 12th, 2020, council member Nadalski. They're good. Work session of March 31st, 2020, council member Stevens. Yes, Chair, they're good. I'm sorry I uh, wasn't there at the first. Uh, I don't move as quickly as I used to, so that's the reason. Oh, no, <laughs> you're okay. Um, but the minutes, but, but the are correct. Thank you. Um, special meeting of March 31st, 2020, Council Member Lopez. Yes, Chair, they're correct. And the regular meeting of April 7th, 2020, Council Member White. Yes, Chair, I've reviewed those and they are correct. And with that, I would make a motion to approve the uh, minutes. Second. 
We have a motion by Council Member Way and a second by Council Member Hire to approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all so much for reading those. So now we are looking forward to hearing from Clint Spencer um, the of the planning team um, to talk with us more about the Southeast Ogden Community Plan. Well, good evening again. Um, always a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'll pull up my presentation here and we'll get started. Perfect. So we're here to discuss once again the Southeast Dogan Community Plan. Uh, this has been an ongoing process for uh, a couple of years now and uh, we're glad to see it come to its fruition and, and get adopted and, and underway. Um, in the last meeting, we talked a lot about um, the plan itself. Uh, the, there's four sections generally. There's uh, the transportation, uh, the, the uh, future zoning, future land use, and then housing portion, and then the open space. A lot of the comments that were made in that meeting were generally about the housing portion and had to deal with accessory dwelling units and how to uh, conquer that, how to, how to handle those in the future. And I know that there were some concerns from the community as well as concerns from the council on just what to do with that accessory dwelling unit issue. So we've kind of, uh, as a staff, we've Come back to the drawing table just a little bit uh, and we've come up with some some uh, alternative language that we hope will will clarify the next steps and, and kind of give a clear process forward of what the, the community plan is actually trying to accomplish and give a, a, a better perspective on how that how the next steps will, will take place so uh, <clears throat> the first thing i want to talk about is why do we have community plans and this is from the ogden city general plan itself in, uh, in section 14, it talks about community plans. And there's five um, essential objectives for community plans. The first one is to balance interests. Uh, in that section, it, it speaks to, <clears throat> there's never one answer, right? And I think that we can accept that for just about anything in the city or in life. There's never just one answer. Uh, and as we've gone through this process over the past couple of years, there's always been a very split response from the community for and against accessory dwelling units. So through this community pro uh, planning process, uh, we took those balance, we took those interests to heart uh, as well as the community did, and they came up with a compromise. And this compromise is reflected in the community plan on, on how, to, uh, how to deal with accessory dwelling units specifically. So that's one of the first objectives of, the, um, of why we have community plans is to balance those interests that we find throughout the community and to accept that, you know, and, and there's always, there's never one, just one answer. Uh, I think when I, when I talk about no one answer, it's that, you know, I think that, that that leads to a conversation for compromise and saying that it's never everything against or everything for, but uh, communities should be able to, to have that kind of voice in their own community. Uh, the next objective is to develop a partnership. So as I mentioned before, we've, uh, through this process, we have uh, we formulated a, a housing steering committee. And through that, <coughs> through that process, we have developed a partnership with the residents and the residents with the city. And then uh, in that committee as well, it, there are partnerships developed from neighbor to neighbor as we discussed how to, how to handle accessory dwelling units and how to deal with housing issues um, other than accessory dwelling units as well throughout the community. Uh, that includes student housing, illegal rentals, how do, we, um, how do we enforce all of these regulations that we have in place to help protect the community. And so um, I, you know, I think through that process, the, the residents were, that were involved have a better relationship or an understanding of what the city's role is and uh, we as a city hopefully have some folks that we can lean on to help us um, you know in, in terms of the preservation and enforcement issues uh, in that uh, in that steering committee meeting or those the steering committee we also experienced a pretty equal representation of people 
uh, of residents for and against accessory dwelling units. And so, um, and as I mentioned before, that's something that we've seen very much so throughout this process is a, is a split response, uh, you know, a split representation of people that have been for them and have been against them. Um, so those are the first couple of objectives. Uh, the next objective, objective is reestablishing and man, maintaining um, the public trust. And to this effect, it's that the plan states that the plan will only be successful, successful in its adoption if everyone knows what it says and what to expect. So community plans are changeable. That's something that we experienced with this community plan since its inception in uh, well, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, there's been over a dozen uh, changes to the plan. And it's, you know, they're not, uh, community plans are certainly not ever meant to be a, a, a crystal ball or a, you know, some kind of fortune teller type of exercise, but it's, it's to um, give some, some, uh, some framework and some understanding of how that community plan should look as, the, as development takes place throughout the city. Um, so we expect, you know, that there's, if there's things that come up uh, in the future, or if there's an opportunity to reconsider some of the provisions within the um, within the, the plan itself, that those those changes, those um, objectives, and those goals and strategies could always change, and uh, you know, however the future lays out, uh, the city. <clears throat> The city should follow similar procedures when, when plans are amended. So um, in the same way that we're going through this plan now, if the community plan were amended, the city should employ a similar uh, type of procedure to let people know that, hey, your, your community plan is being changed. Come and be involved. Let's talk about this. And we do that as, as we update community plans throughout the city. Um, and this one, the most recent, and uh, in the next process, we're, we're looking at the East Central Community Plan, which is adopted in 2015 not quite as old, but there have been some fairly drastic um, changes within that community, uh, such as the Nine Rails Community uh, Arts District and the, the BRT line that will be going through there that will um, affect, you know, affect change one way or the other, whether it's included in the community plan or not. So the community plan, again, is, is just helpful in a framework of how to move uh, these, these issues forward uh, in the community. So going back to um, what the community has stated, so they, from, from what was discussed in, um, in the, community, in the uh, housing steering committee is that there was a, they felt there was a, a perceived breach of, of trust from the Southeastern community, community to, the, the, to the city. Uh, and this occurred when accessory dwelling units approved, were approved citywide. There's, there was very little community input uh, and, and very little comments during the meetings. You can go back and, and look at the, uh, the minutes and, and see that that's apparent. And these are, um, you know, when we get into these large uh, citywide uh, amendments, um, it gets difficult to notice. It, it's, uh, it's not possible for us to notice everybody in the city about these, these pending changes. And uh, we, we do the best that we can in terms of making them making folks aware of, of what the changes might be. Um, that being said, when the community, when the Southeast Ogden community uh, became aware of what had taken place, they, um, they felt that, they, that that wasn't something that they really shared in, in common with what, you know, maybe other people in the city wanted. And so uh, in an effort to help them protect their community and their neighborhood from what they perceived as as uh, things that might compromise their, their single family neighborhood, uh, especially given their adjacency to Weber State, the community proposed an amendment and brought that forward to the city. So through, the, um, through that amendment process is kind of how we got to where we are today. So I wanna go over some of the comments. So the proposal was to, uh, to not allow accessory dwelling units at all in Southeast Ogden. And it went to the, before the Planning Commission and the Planning Commission um, denied the petition. And then it came before the, the City Council. And some of the comments that were made 
uh, during that meeting, I, I think were important to remember and to recall. Um, some of those, so one of the comments was that the council wanted to wait to understand the outcome of the Southeast community plan process. How, how will that process will take place? And um, they thought that the, the plan process will address the matter better than an independent ordinance that was being proposed would. Another a comment included, included handling this issue, handling accessory dwelling units in a more holistic manner. Um, you know, looking at how, you know, as, uh, as was mentioned, you know, ADUs are just one, the one part of housing throughout the community. You know, there's, there's still affordable housing to consider. There's student housing to consider. There's multifamily development uh, to consider in terms of how, how housing will take to take, this is just one, the accessory dwelling units is just one piece of that, of that overall housing puzzle. Uh, and then it shifts the, shifts the issue to one of collaboration. So you know, having the community work together was recommended by the city council. Um, council stated their, their confidence in staff and in the commission, and uh, we appreciate that. And I've always felt the, the, the support of the council as we've moved through these community plan processes. Uh, it's also stated that, these, that this community plan process will be beneficial to additional decisions and future decisions that take place. Um, there were a few comments that stated that um, there was some concern from the, the council that maybe citywide accessory dwelling units may be too broad. Uh, I know in the planning commission uh, meeting that was also a, a, con a, a concern for a couple of our planning commissioners was that maybe we, we painted the, the city too broad with a, with a big brush. Um, and then that the city council would support a more narrow focus on the specific neighborhoods of College Heights and Forest Green, which were the two communities that were really petitioning and pushing for this amendment to be heard. Uh, some more of the comments include that, uh, you know, going through a, a community plan will, will likely adequately access how to handle the accessory dwelling unit issue. Um, and then there was a comment as well that that much of Southeast Ogden is zoned R1, and there's probably a purpose for that zoning. And I know that this was a, a you know a, a concern for residents as well that they felt like, uh, even though it's it's not um, entirely the case that they felt that you know changing these these single family homes into two dwelling units uh, would change the character of their neighborhood. And so that was one of their the, their comments and perceptions as we went through the plan. Uh, council mentioned that they were allow they were comfortable allowing staff and the commission to address the accessory dwelling units, and so going back to that reestablishing and, and maintaining public trust. And this comment is uh, the the plan will only be successful if everyone knows what's in it and knows what to expect. And I think as the commission or as the can the community came before the the uh, the commission regarding the accessory dwelling unit. Um, they, they did expect to have a, the support of the city council. I apologize that my light keeps turning off. I'm not sure why that's happening, but we'll just be in the dark. You have to move around. Yeah, yeah I around. tried that a couple times. It's not picking up what I'm putting down. So, um, so that brings us back to what's included in, in the plan. And so some, as I mentioned before, one of the things that we looked at uh, in the revisions to, uh, to the plan is, um, as, as we heard comments from the last meeting, is maybe you know, providing a better uh, framework for how this next step takes place. What does it look like? And uh, what things will be considered and, and, and what things will be important as we look at uh, establishing any kind of limitation on an accessory dwelling unit. So on the map to the right, you can see that there are um, several different color blobs. So you've got Weaver State that's in the purple, uh, and then IHC campus is in that blue. That's uh, kind of transparent. And then you've got a on the kind of on the northwest or on the top left hand side of the community is the northwest neighborhood. So this neighborhood is already petitioned. They were one of the first community or areas in the city to petition for accessory dwelling units. And so we expect that there will be no limitation of accessory dwelling units in that part of the city uh, as we move forward with this with this process. The other three. Uh, communities, the College Heights, Forest Green, and South Area did have folks in the steering uh, committee 
that expressed concern and or expressed desire to have some you know some form of limitation on how many accessor drawing units could take place. Um, so <clears throat> this 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 uh, process of of amending the, the ordinance will take place after um, after the the plan is adopted one way or the either or the other. So the, the process we're involved in tonight is essentially just looking at the framework. How how is that that next that next process going to take place? And so some of the things that uh, we've included in the new language for factors for consideration um, is to look at additional housing pressures uh, and neighborhood experiences giving is it is adjacency to, to Weber State campus. Um, I think I covered this in, in another slide, but we've talked to some, some traffic and, and uh, parking enforcement about you know what, what kinds of pressures do they see in these communities that are that are closer to Weber State. Um, <clears throat> previous decisions for areas that have, have, that have stemmed from petitions to have or not have accessory dwelling units. And again, this goes back to that Northwest neighborhood have petitioning for them. And again, the folks from the College Heights and, and the uh, Forest Green neighborhoods petitioning to not have them. So taking into consideration what's already been, um, what's already been desired in those in certain neighborhoods. And then looking at the types of housing needs and you know, again, going back to that, that broader puzzle of, of housing in general, and just looking at this accessory dwelling unit as one of that, one of the elements of that housing picture. Um, how does multiple family housing or low density housing options um, come into play or how does student housing affect housing overall in, in the community plan? And, and those, uh, you know, specifically the student housing issue and multiple multifamily housing issues, have, have those have been covered in the plan and how those will take place. And, you know, going back to speaking to where they're gonna be on, you know, major uh, arterial corridors and, and places that will um, that will more easily accommodate that type of use and, and uh, you know, keep it from having a, an, an overly negative effect on single family uh, neighborhoods. Uh, looking at the city's overall approach to affordable housing as well, and uh, making sure that we're not excluding people from living within the city by limiting these accessory dwelling units and uh, getting an equal representation. So just as we did before in the housing committee meetings, uh, making sure that we have an equal representation of people that are before and, and against accessory dwelling units. And, and uh, I'm sure that we'll have to work out some sort of compromise in this next uh, zoning process as well. So another statement um, that has been changed is allowing, so the, this area in the red, the south area, again, as, I, as, as we met with the, the folks in the housing committee, um, there, was, there was concern from the, the neighborhood in the red as well that they, you know, they wanted to have some sort of limitation. So uh, some of the language in the plan was adopted to make that provision, not saying that it has to take place, but you know, allowing that framework to take place. If, if that's how the community feels they want to move forward. So as we look at community pressures adjacent to Weber State, uh, again, I mentioned that I spoke with the city one of the city traffic engineers and our parking enforcement, and uh, they clearly expressed a, um, an opinion and an observation from their um, professionals to points of view that, that there is a heavier traffic and parking demand from 36 to Country Hills Drive. And um, where those, where you see those additional housing or those additional traffic pressures, you'd probably also likely see housing pressures as well. People that want to live closer to campus, that want to be able to, you know, to maybe walk to campus or uh, not have to pay for parking or whatever the case might be. Um, another thing that we looked at as well, and this is reflected on the map to the right, is uh, we looked at, you know, how many. Um, how many of the owners in the, in the neighborhood are, are not actually living on, on the property or have that as their primary residence. And we found uh, in the Forest Green neighborhood about 9%, College Heights about 16 and then the Skyline area, what I'm calling the Skyline area, that's not really a, a title for it, but that green area to the right, it's also semi-adjacent to the community, to the Weber State campus, um, that's about 10%. So uh, you, know, you can look at that College Heights and, and see that there's clearly a, um, a higher um, level of, of owner absentee 
people in that area and that, and you know maybe some more pressure for single family home rentals which is a permitted use uh, in all of our single family zones uh, <clears throat> i also spoke uh, with some of the residents uh, that were in favor of limiting accessory dwelling units uh, as they've been very involved in the process and very involved in the previous accessory dwelling unit um, ordinance amendment. Uh, and I, I just wanted to get some information from them on, on their, you know, on their neighborhood itself. And they stated that there's about 13 uh, currently illegal accessory dwelling units in Forest Green. And what would make them illegal is that they're not currently licensed. We don't have a permit for any of them. Um, and not necessarily that they're operating you know, illegally in terms of how many people are in there, but we just don't have a license. We haven't done a, uh, a home or a, a, a fit premise inspection, which just goes to look at, um, in all of our rental situations, we do a, a fit premise inspection where we can go and look, make sure that the situations that people are living in are actually safe and that they're not gonna be an issue when, you know, when a hazard arises. Uh, also, they spoke about um, the, pref the prefer a, a maximum of 20% of the neighborhood at a maximum to, to be allowed uh, to have accessory dwelling units. So looking at the forest green and college heights, um, they're, you know, they probably average between the two of them about 120 single family homes. And if you take that 120 single family homes and apply you know, maybe 15 to 20%, we're looking at 18 to 24 accessory dwelling units in those areas as a maximum. So where they're looking at right now are 13, uh, 13 of these accessory dwelling units taking place without permits, you know, for them to allow uh, you know, up to 18 to 24 accessory dwelling units in their community. And this would be for each community, not just for the Southeast Ogden community as a whole, but Forest Green would have, you know, possibly 15 to 20%, which would be 18 to 24 in Forest Green, 18 to 24 in in College Heights and you know potentially many, many more in that south um, that south area that I sh showed before given how large the you know the, the geographic area is and how many single-family homes are likely included in that. Um, and another then, oh, okay. sorry, I was going to ask would you mind taking questions now or you want us to wait till the end? Um, I'll, I'll take them as they come. I'm just curious on the previous slide um, and I think you've covered this a little bit before but when you um, you know outline those properties, are those are the ones with a license? So it's not indicating ones that the neighbors have necessarily identified. It's the ones that actually are licensed to be rentals. No. So this uh, this map that is being shown here, this doesn't indicate who has a license or who doesn't. This is just showing um, people in the community where the owner of the property doesn't live at the at the property or doesn't have that as their primary. Um, residents. So these are likely being operated as a rental. And I'm, I, um, I'm not sure if they're operating as an illegal rental or as a legal rental, but this was just to give an idea of, of the, you know, what kinds of pressures do people face. You know, I, I obviously the, in the College Heights area closer to campus, there's more of a, of a housing pressure to have a rental. It's more likely to succeed there because of its adjacency. Weber State and you're going to be able to rent that out easier than if you move farther away from from campus. Right, yeah, I just was trying to clarify things. Does that make yeah, that, a related question, Chair? Yeah. Uh, what is an illegal rental, Clint? Could you define what that is? Um, illegal rental, so there's, a, there's so we, you can rent a single family home, um, but you have to stay within what is defined as a single family home by by city ordinances and that can be uh, you know in, in a home of related adults that can be you know mom and dad grandma grandpa uh, adult children living in the home um, that People is by blood or marriage is really what you're saying then. right that's considered a single family a legal single single family but when you get into rentals it's folks that are you know when you have more than three uh, generally more than three unrelated adults that are living in a in a home together that would be seen as an illegal rental. So, yeah. Or people that just don't have a, a license. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and that would be that would be the same for an illegal accessory dwelling unit. It's if they're exceeding what the, what the ordinance allows, 
or if they just don't have a license, it's also seen as illegal and that would need to come in compliance. Um, so again, going back to you know, some of the, the folks in the forest green neighborhood, um, one of the things they felt uh, like was an issue is, uh, is the, the issue of enforcement. And um, I think this is an enforcement is, is certainly an issue for accessory dwelling units, as well as any illegal rental uh, in the community. I think that a lot of people uh, looked at you know the community and saw that you know in a lot of situations there were more there were, there were several students living in a single family home and um, that's not that's not even an accessory dwelling unit but that's just an illegal rental situation. But uh, making making sure that, that there's better enforcement of those issues would provide some comfort to the people that live, you know, close to that uh, Weber State University campus. Uh, and they felt that if enforcement measures were able to improve in the future, they would be open to reconsidering um, allowing more accessory dwelling units. All right, Clint, uh, can I have a question? Go ahead. Um, does the plan or the committee give any recommendation how to how to enforce either illegal, illegal or rentals or or ADUs. Do, do they bring that up at all? Um, no, that was uh, that was something that we discussed in house as, though as a as a as a uh, as city staff. Um, and the, some of the provisions that are within the plan uh, to help enforcement. One of them is to create a website where people can go and, um, and see where all of the rentals or accessory dwelling units or uh, we're currently working on it for uh, vacation rentals. So if somebody has a, a question, you know, if they see something going on next door and they want to find out, is this a legal rental or is this a legal vacation rental or is this a legal accessory dwelling units, they can go to a website and you know, we'll have a, a way that they can search and, and identify you know, where the licenses for legal accessory dwelling units are located. And then they, that will help in, in our enforcement issues as well. So if they identify, if they see that their neighbor you know, maybe has a dot on their, on their property saying that yes, they have a legal accessory dwelling units, then that can put their mind at ease that you know, they've gone through the proper measures and they've got the proper permit from the city to have an accessory dwelling units or you know, if there's a concern in terms of housing or how it's being run or operated, and they don't see a dot saying that there's a legal rental, then they can report that to, to, the, uh, to the city for, for enforcement. And then we can uh, hopefully utilize those folks as well as a, as a resource for those enforcement measures. Or do we have that website available or are we? Are we, uh, we're, we have it, um, it's in the works. Uh, I I know that it hasn't gone live or anything like that, but um, it, it certainly is in the works. And I can maybe see, I think I, I have it, I may have it bookmarked and might be able to bring that up. Um, maybe after my presentation, I'll see if I can get into that and okay. see if I can kind of give an idea of what that looks like. I know that one portion of it was the, the map and then the other portion was, you know, a, a reporting, um, an opportunity to report. So it made it really easy if people didn't see a dot there, they could make a quick report and send it on. But I'll, I'll try to bring that up um, after the presentation, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Clint. You're welcome. That's if I can find it. <laughs> it's been a little while since <laughs> we've worked on that, given the whole pandemic. But So some of the other language amendments that we're looking at, um, some of the language that was in the plan before in terms of uh, how it addressed multifamily and student housing included the word intrusion, which uh, folks saw that as a kind of a negative connotation to uh, associate with, with multifamily and student housing. And so uh, while that was certainly not the intent of the plan to make that, a, you know, try to, to paint these multifamily types of housing as a negative uh, asset or a, a negative impact in the city, um, we just wanted to clarify that the making sure that as those multifamily and student housing developments take place, the single family homes have measures in place to protect them. Um, currently, you know, those, there are measures in place today that, that, um, that 
multifamily housing is, is required to adhere to in terms of landscaping or setbacks or, or screening, all of those types of issues would help in, um, in mitigating the, the impact that those more, you know, more intensive types of um, developments would, would have. Um, okay, and this last uh, piece of language here speaks to uh, an email we got from a well-renowned uh, trail traveler and, and, and uh, connoisseur, if you will. But there was some language in the plan that um, kind of pitted the, the maintenance of the trails, uh, pitted hiker versus biker and why ruts are occurring or why you know, certain uh, issues are taking place. And, and really that's not the issue at all, but the issue in, in, in instance, in this specific instance, the, the abuse trailhead uh, is that it was, when it was developed, it just was, was never properly developed. It wasn't, uh, the design was bad. And, and so because of changing um, you know, waterfall and, and changing conditions, the, the trail is just eroded. So we just wanted to, we didn't want to create some, you know, an additional kind of uh, controversy within the plan between, you know, hiker versus biker. So we just decided to take that language out and clearly just state that, um, that the, the maintenance issue for this plan, for the trails um, you know, needs to be considered in terms of management and then funding for how that, those improvements take place. So again, um, this is the process outline. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been a lot of places and we've uh, talked with a lot of people. We've taken a lot of comment and uh, hopefully these, these final revisions um, kind of make us comfortable so that we can uh, move forward with our recommendation tonight. And then uh, after the recommendation, the next steps again are going back to that, uh, one of the first ones anyways is going back to that zoning amendment for accessory dwelling units and uh, determining you know, how that language is gonna, gonna take place. And then again, that will come back before the city council for approval. Um, as was mentioned in our, in our pre-meeting, I don't think that we wanna set any kind of premise that you know, what, is, uh, what is recommended by the steering committee, they're clearly a, a recommending body only. Um, you know, they're, not, they're not the ones that uh, get voted in, so to speak, and, and take the, the, the brunt of re the responsibility, but uh, they clearly are a, a you know, they, they are a committee that has a, a vested interest in, interest in their, in their area, but not to, you know, necessarily require the community or the city to adopt exactly what the, the, uh, the steering committee will recommend. But with all of that said, um, if there's any questions, I would be glad to uh, take one take what I can and answer it. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> I might be all commented out on this topic. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Clint, um, again, for all your work on this plan. It's really a comprehensive plan, and I really appreciate all of your efforts. Um, at this time, I think we'll um, open up the uh, comment period on this particular item only. Um, and just a note that, you know, obviously we have been a lot of discussions about this topic. And we did take quite extensive comments um, the first time that this was on the agenda. So my guidance would be is if you do have a comment, you may want to direct it toward the change in the language that Clint has presented versus maybe saying the same things you said before. So that's my one little caveat, if you don't mind. So Brandon, would you mind telling people how they might comment? Sure, if I could. Oh, sorry, oh. Clint, yes. Sorry. So I was able to find that website if you would like oh. to see that. Well, yeah, that would be great if you don't mind before we open the comments. Sorry to interrupt that. I, no, I, I appreciate it. I forgot that you were going to look that up. I didn't know you were going to be so fast. I, I forgot that I was going to look that up too. And I remember <laughs> right after I stopped my, my meeting or my uh, 
anytime, especially in this format, feel free to interrupt me anytime because it's hard for me to know when people want to speak. So this is what we're working on for vacation rentals. So you can see these, these red dots here. Um, and you can see in the legend what they, you know, blue dots are non-owner occupied and the, the orange dots are owner occupied. So you know, somebody could, could come in here and look at that dot and, and click on it and say, okay, all right, these people have a license. The license is active. It gives the information on uh, who, the, who the owner is. If there's a, an emergency contact, they would give that as well. So this is something similar to what we would be looking at for uh, accessory dwelling units, as well as you know, potentially looking at it for all rentals, uh, which would be a little more intensive process, but uh, something that we would probably look into in the future. So, and then and on the so, other side, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to ask if it's live right now. Uh, it is not live right now. It's only it's only within the city, I think. So we haven't, like I said, we were in the process of getting it for everything finalized, and then COVID hit, and we kind of got sidetracked. So. Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll try to get this back going and, and uh, get it active again, but. That uh, certainly happened to most of us as well. You know, yeah, right. Um, and then on the other side of the, of the, uh, the web page is again, just this opportunity to report uh, or report inquiry. So people can come here and say, you know, this is what I saw going on and they can attach photos and submit that. And then that will go to our code force, code service people and to our uh, planning people as well. And so we'll be able to, to do a little bit better pro or a little bit better process in, in enforcement. So that was that. Great, thanks so much for pulling that up. Any questions or comments about that for Clint? Okay, so um, yeah, Brandon, I'll let you go ahead and tell people how they might participate. Thank you, Chair. Um, in order to participate in this comment uh, period regarding the Southeast Ogden Community Plan, you have to be joining us via Zoom and by using the raise hand feature, which is found at the bottom of the application. It does not look like anybody, any of the attendees are joining via telephone, so we don't need to go over those instructions. So. Um, Again, this is for the Southeast Ogden Community Plan only. And uh, with that, we will get things started. Uh, Angel Castillo, uh, the time is yours. Please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. Thank you. Um, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Good evening, council members. Uh, first off, I'd like to qualify that any of the data I'd be referencing in my statement is from the 2018 Census Bureau, the MLS, and other market studies. So feel free to reach out to me if you'd like any links to this data. Long and the short of it, there is no magic bullet for housing, period. The best that we can do is hope for a comprehensive strategy to ease the pain points. And this strategy involves multifamily dwellings, ADUs, and tiny homes. And if you limit any of those strategies, you're removing a tool from the box to allow our working class families, first year teachers, firefighters, police, and graduate students to live and work in Ogden. And while Council Member White encouraged you all to remember that part of our plan involves multifamily dwellings, there's a pending ordinance coming to you soon limiting or abolishing C2, C3 multifamily dwellings. Between limiting ADUs and quite possibly limiting or abolishing C2, C3 multifamily, you'll pretty much guarantee that those that make under 50000 a year will never be able to afford to live and work in Ogden. And if they can't afford to live here, they take their total impact from tax revenue with them and spend it in another city. That's a loss of $13,469 worth of tax revenue spending per average apartment dweller or ADU occupant. So why are ADU ADUs and multifamily dwellings important? Because if you want people to purchase a single family home or a condo, they need to have financially attainable housing in order to afford purchase down payment. So the current housing availability in Ogden for both rental and single family homes, pretty much 2017 to 2020, the average home price in Ogden has increased 37% of all housing units in Ogden, 44.6 are renter occupied and the average renter vacancy rate is 1.9%. Ogden's population is 87,325, so 44.6 of that equals 38,946 renters. That means only 4.6% of the housing stock is affordable. Um, if you want to make sure that we're going to allow people to stay here and spend money here, we have to allow ADUs, and they do not affect the quality of a single-family home neighborhood as they're not visible from the street. 
And as council member Heyer pointed out during work session, uh, a mask mandate is an invasion of privacy while limiting ADUs or violating property rights and people's pathway to financial stability. I implore you not to remove another housing tool from the toolbox. Don't make the mistake that other cities have made. There are, I, I've spent a significant amount of time in two major cities and I have been on the front lines of what a housing crisis looks like. And by allowing ADUs, tiny homes and multifamily dwellings, you're going to alleviate those pain points and keep us from having the ship sink. Please do not limit ADUs. Thank you. Thanks, Angel. Marcy, the time is yours. Please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. My name is Marcy Matonis. I live in Forest Green. Uh, my family and I relocated to Utah in 2016 from Florida. We wanted seasons and lower crime and a slower pace. We rented an apartment in downtown Ogden for six months. We found the perfect single family home in a low density suburban neighborhood in Forest Green. I learned a short time after uh, we moved there that the ordinance allowing the ADUs included our neighborhood, sort of ignorant as to the ADU issue. I was actually surprised that the zoning allowed for that. I also learned that because of the minimal notice requirement, most of my neighbors were unaware of the opt-out option um, that several of our bordering neighborhoods have taken advantage of. I attended the planning commission in 2017, shared my concerns, um, when the issue was brought for the count before the council, the council said, go, re, uh, go address the Southeast plan. It's not been updated in 30 years. The, the planning commission, along with interested neighbors, worked long and hard through steering committees. There were surveys, there were meetings to update the Southeast plan. I was able to attend a few of the steering committee meetings myself as my work schedule permitted. Um, the ADU issue certainly drums up a lively debate. Um, but when the two opposing sides did come together, opposing neighbors put their heads together, they came up with a compromise, and that has what has been submitted to the court, um, primarily on a cap on the number of ADUs in the given area. This is a no-brainer to me. This is a density issue, it's a parking issue, it's a traffic issue, it's a compliance issue. Um, there's no code enforcement happening on the ones that are currently up and running. And as previously mentioned, we have a dozen or so in our enforced screen alone that are alone that are illegal. Um, it is unsettling to me that this council would make a directive, give a directive to the planning commission, the community members would then take the time out of their busy to schedules to attend steering committees, a compromise would be presented to the council, and it would not be wholeheartedly accepted by the council, or that uh, certain members would really just sort of dismiss it out of hand. Um, we've had zoning restrictions in place for ever. Um, this is not a property rights issue. Um, this is not a free for all community. We have laws and rules and regulations and zonings for a reason. If you don't want to be um, subjected to that, then go live on a deserted island. Um, again, this is a code enforcement issue, compliance issue. Um, that's all I have at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Keith Sato, the time is yours. Please limit your uh, comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. I think I just unmuted. Keith Sato, Ogden resident. Um, I just want to say um, we have growing population pressures in Ogden and by allowing a single neighborhood of our wealthiest residents, including the mayor, it places all the population pressures on the rest of Ogden, putting the burden on the poorer neighborhoods. If code enforcement is an issue, then enforce code. That's all I've got to say. Took my 30 seconds. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Heath. I was muted. Jenny, the time is now yours. Please limit your comments to three minutes and state your full name for the record. 
Hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Jenny Nagy. Um, I, I have uh, commented before about the benefits of ADUs, um, affordable housing, uh, increased support of supplemental income for homeowners, um, and just that it's within an owner's property rights to decide whether or not to have an ADU. I think um, at this point in the conversation, it's worth saying that I think it's important to listen to community input, definitely, but I think it's important to listen to input from the community as a whole. And I think that we don't want, certainly individual neighborhoods should um, have space to say, um, to, to express themselves of how their neighborhood um, is planned and developed. But I think we also can't um, have individual neighborhoods making decisions at the expense of um, the, the city as a whole. A, a, um, a little bit unprepared for this, um, but I, I think um, we want to make decisions and think of the Ogden community as a whole. Um, think of, about what is good for Ogden as a city, and I think there's, I don't know, Um, space for an individual neighborhood input, but at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the council to do what's best for the city as a whole. That's it. Thanks, Jenny. Is there anyone else that would like to make a comment? Tom Farrell, the time is yours. Please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. I think you'll have to unmute, Tom. Yeah, I would urge the, uh, once again, oh, I'm Tom, Tom yeah, Farrell. Yeah, state your full name for the record. Sure, it's Thomas Farrell and I live in uh, Forest Green. And I would urge the council to accept the steering committee's recommendations. Uh, the steering committee and Mr. Spencer spent a significant amount of time getting public input on the effects of ADUs on the individual communities. The, uh, in our community, in Forest Green alone, uh, we have a number that are illegal. Uh, they've never uh, engaged code to, or complied with the code to have their ADUs permitted. That's, that's a code enforcement issue. But the deleterious effect that it has on the neighborhood is the increase on density. This community is zoned for R1. A zoning restriction is not a violation of property rights. Uh, that's zoning restrictions have been in place for years. What ADUs do though, is they flip the zoning restrictions on their head and increase the, the density of the population in that area. And what the effect of this is, is that it allows for more parking, more traffic, and the uh, effect of that is that the parking becomes now on street parking. So now we have difficulties with snow plows. We also have difficulties with people who are towing vehicles through the neighborhood, trying to uh, weave in and out of all the park vehicles parked on the street. I actually lived in a neighborhood that had quote unquote mother-in-law suites or uh, 
uh, garage apartments where the neighborhoods were actually zoned for multi-use. So you had single family residential units uh, interspersed with multifamily. So the neighborhood was actually designed in, for that purpose. It was a mess because of all the cars parked on the streets because uh, of these multifamily units being dropped into single family residential areas. We moved into an area for R1 zone for single family residential areas. We did not move into a multifamily neighborhood because of, we did not want to have the increased density of multifamily residential areas. And I would ask that the council accept the recommendations of the steering committee and have accept that compromise. Tom, can I ask a clarifying question? So are you sure. agreeing with the change in the language or are you disagreeing? I guess I'm just not sure when you I, say, accept I'm, the, I'm sorry, accepting the steering committee recommendations. Are you saying you agree with the new language? I am, yes. I just want to, understand thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I disagree with the concept of an ADU, quite okay. frankly. However, I recognize that the commission made this, or the council made this uh, decision years ago. And so I'm willing to accept that with this, the steering commission's recommendations. Okay, thank you. Cindy Markowski, your, the time is yours. Please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. I think you need to unmute, Cindy. There you go. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. I'd just like to start out by um, thanking the city council and the planning commission and my respect for you over the past two and a half years has grown exponentially. Thank you so much for your service with all these decisions. We live in an interesting climate these days where the unity of community is being pulled apart. Uh, respect for um, opinions of others, tolerances of differences and so forth. Um, what you had here with this uh, steering, housing steering committee for the updating of the Southeast Community Plan was a polar opposite. It was a thrilling experience to sit on that, on that committee and have people from total opposite opinions come together and work hard, come together with a compromise that meets the needs of all. And it was a privilege to participate in that process. So thank you for allowing uh, that process to work. Um, I want to clarify that um, we as a steering committee and as a, a neighborhood are not asking for preferential treatment, but rather we were simply asking for what um, the Mount Ogden community already has in place, and that is in their community plan a, an exemption from ADUs. We realized that ADUs are here to stay to some degree, so we were willing to work and compromise so that the needs of all residents are respected and, and met. Um, it was very clear that there's a 50-50 uh, difference as, as, as has been already stated. And so why not compromise and recognize the desires? We can all, we can all work together and um, it, it can work well. I just want to point out um, I think it's been a little bit the elephant in the room that hasn't been addressed enough yet is the impact of Weber State. We love Weber State. It is a gem in our community and we want the neighborhoods around it to reflect that. They do need to be protected from university sprawl. It's so important. You've seen in other communities where the neighborhoods have had an imbalance with student housing and single, stable single family neighborhoods um, become blighted. We don't want that to happen on our beautiful East Bench. Um, I want to uh, emphasize, I think, something that's really lacking in the community is education about ADUs and the importance of uh, the licensing 
and meeting all of the code requirements. Um, and of course, also the enforcement issue as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. So I guess I just wanted to ask you the same follow-up question. So are you saying you also agree with the change language that's been proposed? Yes, I am saying that. And I, I wanted to point out that one of, one of the points, you know, was about uh, the previous decisions for areas that have stemmed from petitions um, uh, in other areas. But yes, I am approving the, the new language. Thank, Thank you. you, Clint. I'm not seeing any other hands raised this time about this topic. So unless there's further discussion, um, I'd be happy to entertain a motion. Here, motion to close the public hearing. It wasn't a public hearing, um, Council Member Nadolski. It was just public okay. input, but thank you. Sorry. No, thanks. I appreciate the motion. <laughs> Chair, I'd like to propose that we adopt the proposed ordinance 2020 30 with the substitute language that Clint proposed uh, earlier to us in our, um, with the proposed language. Um, I don't remember all of it, so I won't. Is that sufficient, Glenn? Just want to make sure. Yeah, I think um, if possible, we'd like to make it a two-step process uh, or a two-vote process. So uh, I think we'd recommend that you you make a motion and, and take action to substitute that Exhibit A with the new uh, exhibit with the new plan with the new language, and then you can you can vote on the ordinance with the substitute amendment. I think that might make it a little bit easier as far as process goes. All right, then I make the motion that we substitute the language in Exhibit A. I second it. So a motion by Council Member White and a second by Council Member Stevens to um, substitute the language. And would this be a voice vote or a roll call vote? Uh, Janine can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's a roll call vote. A roll call vote. Thank you. Hey, I, I was on the right track. Thank you all so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Councilmember Heyer? No. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Nadolski? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Vice Chair Blair. I see him, but he's, yep, I can see your mouth moving, aye? Yeah. Okay. Chair Traberka? No, and that passes. Um, Council Member Heider, would you like to comment on your no vote? Uh, yes, I, I, you know, in the work session, I talked about a precedent setting thing and, and Cindy Markeski kind of reinforced that when she referenced uh, Mount Ogden community uh, having an exemption from ADUs. I, I think that um, much of this discussion centers around a, a misunderstanding of ADUs. Uh, I do understand the anxiety. I, I honestly do. Um, I am not seriously opposed to this amendment, but philosophically, I, I think we, we've kind of gone down this path in the wrong direction. And that's why I voted the way I did on this part of this, uh, this motion. Thanks. And yeah, I concur uh, with Council Member Heyer that um, I just have some challenges around this particular part of the plan. That's all. Okay, would anybody like to propose another motion? I'll make the motion that we uh, adopt ordinance 2020-30 uh, with the amended Exhibit A language. Second. 
We have a motion by Council Member Heyer and a second by Council Member White. And this is a roll call vote. This is to adopt the Southeast Community Plan with the exception, with the change. <laughs> Council Member Lopez? Aye. Council Member Nadolski? Aye. Council Member Stevens? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Shaburka? No. That, that passes. Finally, we can celebrate that the Southeast Community Plan has passed. Congratulations, Clint and your team, and Glenn, for all of your work as well on this project. We really appreciate it. I should probably just comment on my no vote. I think you guys uh, kind of know where I stand. I do sincerely appreciate the community engagement in this project. I just fundamentally disagree with the, the decision around the housing plan, but the rest of the plan is, is really awesome. So thank you. Yeah, can I make a comment also? Please. I, I have the same conflict that you do, I believe, uh, surrounding this. Um, and now that, I, that the steering committee will be engaging on uh, this, the discussions around this, I, I hope that they will um, focus on a, a, a percentage rather than a distance uh, separation. Um, I think everybody that, that wants to be able to do it to a point, you know, I, I, I get that if 80% if of the community all did ADUs, it could be a problem. But, uh, but I hope that we can recognize that it is a property rights issue. Uh, as, as much as some people would like to think it's not, um, uh, I hope they'll they'll focus on on the uh, the percentage only and not a not a uh, a distance separation issue. I, I can't get around the distance separation. Thanks and thank you all so much for all your engagement around the plan. I think it was really great conversations and hopefully provided some additional education for people around EDUs, rentals, property rights, and, you know, all these enforcement issues along with it. Sure, can I, I, I come in? Yeah. Sorry, was that you, Council Member Heyer and then Nadolski? Yeah, I, I just was saying that I, I really liked the map that planning is coming up with. Um, that is going to be a, a tool with, that's going to get some traction, I think. I, I, I love that they're doing that. I think that's a great thing. Councilmember Nadolski. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that I have admittedly gone back and forth a lot on this one. Um, this was a hard decision to make, but I uh, leaned the way I did because I, I kind of, I just feel like I agree with the committee and not only for this neighborhood, but potentially for other neighborhoods as well. And that if there are concerns about, um, inequities and burdens uh, being carried by one neighborhood that are not uh, being carried by this, I would just say that I, I also would support um, in future community plans if if those processes were as robust as this one and that the feedback from that neighborhood was similar to the feedback that this uh, community has provided, that we would strongly consider the same uh, limitations or exemptions in, in, at that time. And so, um, I think that, in, in my view, I think that the, uh, the committee made a, a reasonable and very responsible recommendation for the neighborhood, especially in light of the um, uniqueness of proximity to the students and um, our awesome university. And I would not be opposed to entertaining the same limitations in other neighborhoods if that's what's wanted. I've heard a lot of people say <clears throat> it's not fair that they get to have an exemption and we don't. And to me, that suggests that they don't that they want an exemption too, or some sort of limitation, I should say. I mean, um, and if that's the case, then that's something that we need to know and, and uh, address in a community plan by community plan process. Thanks. Thanks, any other comments? Yeah, I just have a, a quick comment. I, it, I too had a hard time with this, this process, um, not the process. I am a very processed person actually. Um, I had a, it was a tough decision um, on, all, on all levels and all issues. 
Um, but what it came down to me, just so you know, that it, it's more than just, again, the ADUs. Um, the other thing that we have to realize is that uh, I think Mr. Farrell actually said it correctly in that he moved into an area where it was an R1 and he has property rights as well. And so we have to be careful when we make decisions and say just easy answers of it's a property rights issue that they can have ADUs. It's it's not. I mean, we have to look at all all sides of the coin. So um but this was good for everyone to, we've, we've engaged our council once again on a really a hard topic. So thank you. Thank you, Clint, by the way, and thank you, Glenn. <laughs> Absolutely, great conversations. Here, can I also add my appreciation to Clint as well and the community that participated. I think that, uh, I, I just can't imagine a process being more fair and transparent than what Clint oversaw and um, that has got to count for quite a bit for all of us. And uh, I just want you to know, Clint, that how much I appreciate the process and that the comments I made early on um, for me stood true. And um, the quality of the work that you did uh, played an important role in the decision I made tonight. And that uh, it was also clear in the folks that I talked to from, from the community just how uh, uh, honorable uh, and ethical you are as a man and the character that you uh, carried throughout the process. So. I very much commend you for that, uh, both as a planner for the city, but as a, as a man. Uh, thank you for, for all of that. Well, I appreciate your comments. Um, I just wanna also recognize our staff and uh, city staff here. Uh, it makes things easy to look good. Uh, Glenn and Greg and our planning staff with Joe and Brooke and Amber have all been very helpful and, and certainly not to leave out the, the Southeast Oregon community as well. They've been um, a very involved, uh, very involved community, which is a, a real breath of fresh air. So, thank you for those. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, well, now we're to the section in our agenda where we have the opportunity for um, attendees to address the council regarding any concerns or ideas. Um, this is the public comment portion. And um, please limit your comments to three minutes and remain as civil as you possibly can. Brandon, do you, do you mind explaining to the group, although they seem like uh, regulars, but we'll do it one more time just in case. Sure. Um, to participate in public comments, you have to be joining us via Zoom and use the uh, raise hand feature found at the bottom of your screen. Um, Amy Wicks. Uh, the time is yours. Please limit your comments to three minutes, as Chair Chaburka said, and state your name for the record. All right. Uh, thank you, Amy Wicks, Ogden resident. Um, I am just uh, back here again this week, as I said I would be until you deal with the issue to speak about recycling. Last week, there was commitment from administration to fix the Ogden City website to update the information that um, what you put in your blue can is not being recycled uh, and to let citizens know about that. Um, that false information is still on the city website. Nothing's happened there. So I am just asking the question, you know, how hard is it to fix the website? It shouldn't be, it should be something that could be quickly fixed. Um, we have a lot of highly paid communications people within the city that can wordsmith that and deal with that. Um, so do your jobs, fix the website. Don't lead people to believe that you're recycling when you're not. Um, I would also like to challenge you to change your mindset that recycling should be a moneymaker for the city. Um, people's utility bills went from around $25 in 2000 to about $75 now if you have the smallest trash can and use the least amount of water possible for a household. Um, we've added a lot of things, storm water. Uh, we're taking care of you know, what's downstream. Recycling is taking care of what's downstream or taking care of the future. It's keeping perfectly good materials out of a landfill. 
it's making it so that we don't have to look for additional landfill space in the future. So I would encourage you to continue to hold administration's toes to the fire and, um, you know, get a timeline for it so citizens know what to expect and, you know, don't, don't expect us to continue sorting our recyclables just because it's a good habit to have. Um, you know, bring that service back. That's one of the few things you should be doing as a city. Um, and uh, just one last thing regarding masks, you know, judging from the city council Facebook uh, cover photo, some of the city council members don't understand basic science and support wearing masks, but I would encourage the city to um, listen to the governor. He doesn't seem to want to take political pressure for that. Uh, our mayor doesn't seem to want to take that pressure either, but it's in his lap now. Uh, we know science tells us wearing a mask can help keep communities safe and pre prevent the spread of COVID-19. And if we want to keep businesses open and keep kids and teachers and schools safe, we need to do that as a community. So I would encourage you to pass something regarding that. Thanks, Amy. Any other comments? Angel Castillo, the floor is yours. Please limit your time to three minutes and state your name for the record. Thank you, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, well, as I'm sure you all know, I'm not pleased that there was a limitation on ADUs. So I'd like to take this time to just revisit some of the affordability issues that I believe should be driving the majority of your land use decisions, because um, I know that some of you sit on the Wasatch 2050 Council and know that that 5 million number for Utah is real by 2050. And most of that population is going to be here and in Salt Lake. And we're going to, be need, to need to be prepared for housing. And as I said before, I've seen it happen firsthand where cities have been unprepared for allowing workforce housing. And when I say workforce housing, I mean the people that work at Costco. I'm talking about your baristas. I'm talking about your medical receptionists. And again, I'm talking about the first year fire police and uh, teachers and grad students from Weaver. If we're able to be able to live and work here and stay here, if you want your kids to come back to Ogden and stay here, they're gonna to need to be afford housing. And, you know, we are just, we're just exploding. I mean, from 2017 to 2020, the average home price has increased by 37%. And during 2019, the median price for a single family two bedroom home is 270 and the average price is 310,000. For a three bedroom home, the median price is 335 with an average of 355. Households have to earn between 59 and 97% of area median income to find affordable housing that they can make a down payment, that they can actually make those rents. And, and we are not accommodating for that. And we need to accommodate for that by non-traditional. We're not gonna do it by building more single family homes. You know, private real estate is still gonna go up and that's good for the city because the tax revenue comes in. But at the same token, we have a renter population that we have to address. And multifamily housing is the answer. And one thing that I do applaud in the South Ogden plan is that I, I fully support making sure that multifamily is long arterial lines. The last thing I want anybody to do is plop a hundred unit apartment building in the middle of a single family residence. It, it, it just doesn't make sense, but it needs to be on a transit line or the main arterial streets. And that's one of the reasons why ADUs were such a good answer because you don't see it from the street. It allows people to be able to become financially independent. It allows young couples to be able to save for to buy their home. So I urge you to really think about where we're going with housing affordability and keep this in mind when we when those committees come back to you and make recommendations. And very much importantly, when you see the C2, C3 multifamily ordinance that, uh, might, that might be eliminating multifamily. Thank you. Thanks, Angel. I'm not seeing any other hands raised at this time. Is there last call for comments? <laughs> Mm 
that chair? Yes. All right, take a few minutes if, if possible. Um, I'm wondering, Doug, um, should we let the mayor make his comments first oh. and then it's council comments? Would that be okay? That'd be fine. Sorry. Okay. Oh, no problem. I'm, I'm just trying to follow the agenda. I don't always do that. So <laughs> great. Yeah, I don't see any other hands. So now I'd like to invite uh, Mayor Caldwell if you'd like to make any comments. Thanks, Councilman. I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to add my gratitude to the planning department for all the community engagement they did. This was a, an emotional issue for a lot of people. We've seen that. We've heard about it and, and we respect that. I uh, would like to address a couple things that were said. Uh, the recycling information that we promised to update on the website has been updated and we'd promised to get back to you in two weeks with options in terms of what the costs are to go to a lot of different options and we still have a plan to get that to you by next Tuesday in that work session. So we're working on that. We appreciate that. Um, but again, this Southeast community plan, uh, there were some accusations taken at me. I didn't participate in that at all. It was the community. I sat on my hands and let the community around us decide what they wanted to do. I think those are unfair accusations because it was a very robust and open process and we've appreciated everybody that came on board and, and those that were willing to engage and invest in that and, and we're very grateful for that. So with that, I just want to again say uh, we appreciate everything everybody's doing in this era of COVID and, and some of the crazy. I'll just give a personal example. I, my daughter's a, a, an athlete. We uh, got a note that she was going to be accepted into her D1 program, and they were bringing athletes in. We drove out on Wednesday, on Friday. Before she was supposed to move in on Monday, they sent us an email out. Ben could probably relate to a lot of this with uh, Big Sky Athletics and everything else. Uh, well, well, pump the brakes. That's not going to happen. We're going to have to retool it and, and refigure some things out. So there are no concrete answers to this. I think uh, we're over two weeks in a row of, of declining cases in Weber County. I think for the most part, people have taken personal responsibility to wear masks and be responsible and do what they can to help slow this. Um, I want to thank the school district. If you didn't see, we had a Facebook Live with Rich and I, the, the superintendent of the school district, and they talked a lot about what they're trying to do to bring kids back to school to have some regularity, understanding the need to, for kids to, there's a, an educational component, but there's also a socialization component that kids need. And we're just all in uh, a, an unprecedented time. So we've appreciated our community coming together, wearing masks, being responsible, being patient with each other, being kind with each other, standing each other up. And that's what I hope we can continue to do. Um, you have our commitment to look at these issues and, and do what we can. I, I think it's unfair to say that people are kicking the can down the road and not taking responsibility for things that are happening around us. That's not the case at all. It's not the case with all of our department directors. It's not the case with the school district and, and the other groups that I engage in. Uh, I'm, I'm real proud of what's happening in, in Ogden and, and with our community and, and with the school district and everything else. These are unprecedented times and, and people are not asleep at the switch as they're looking at what we need to do and how we can approach this and continue to be healthy with our economy, but continue to be healthy with each other. And so I appreciate everybody's patience and kindness as we go through this. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Caldwell. Okay, Council Member Stevens, I know you had something to say if you'd like to go first. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was looking forward to be able to watch Weber State play uh, this fall, but uh, I understand the situation and the conditions that we're in. And so I wore my purple shirt uh, uh, in lamenting that, uh, that opportunity. But uh, uh, I, um, we, in our work session, we, we as a council, uh, under council business, we talked about the uh, importance of mask and uh, and we've given some directions and uh, and hopefully uh, uh, the comments that were taken will uh, be coming forth. Uh, I appreciated uh, councilman or council member Lopez and his his ideas and uh, I think uh, we as a council have uh, ind indicated in that uh, work session that 
uh, we're, we're going to be the leadership, uh, an example uh, of the importance of wearing a mask. We, my wife and I, we do that all the time. Uh, this Southeast Community Plan was not a very easy, in fact, it was very difficult. Um, it could have gone either way, but uh, I personally want to thank uh, our council sp staff, especially Glenn, uh, you know, on our council there, uh, staff that uh, in his input, I think he did a great job in trying to uh, analyze the Southeast uh, community plan and, and give us as council members the information that we needed at, at the particular time. Uh, and also the planning. Uh, Clint, I think you did an outstanding job. And as uh, Ben mentioned, it was very transparent. And, and uh, your uh, presentation was right to the point. We could understand uh, some of the negatives and some of the positives of this community plan and all community plans has that. Uh, but uh, uh, you did a great job in there and, and it speaks volume of not only your expertise, but also the expertise of Greg Montgomery and your entire uh, department that works there. Uh, next, I would like to go to the community. Uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, I hope that in all situations or in most situations that we could have the community come and, and voice their concerns and, and their uh, suggestions. That's what makes a, uh, an effective uh, community is uh, we could see uh, that you have an interest in not only the area where you live, but also the city of Ogden. Uh, the steering committee, I wanna thank them for the time and effort that they spent on this community plan. It had many uh, avenues to go on and uh, I think they pre presented and listened. And the, the word that I uh, heard Cindy mentioned uh, several times was that there were two sides on this steering committee, but they are able to compromise and come together. And I think that's the importance of good government is when we can come together and compromise in, in that aspect there. Um, I just uh, appreciate the, the feedback. Um, we still have a lot to do. This is not the, the, last, the first and last step. There are going to be many steps in between and uh, uh, the council and the council staff and the planning commission and the citizens will have many, many, uh, are a lot to do in, in formulating the importance of some of the issues that were in this community plan. So I thank you all and uh, I hope you stay safe and, uh, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Chair, I'd like to make just a quick comment. Uh, well, maybe a couple of quick comments. Uh, one, earlier when we were having the discussions about the mask, I just wanted to say that, that uh, those ideas were as much as uh, uh, were uh, Councilmember Nadolski's ideas as they were mine. Um, I need to give him credit because we came up with them together. So um, there's that. And uh, I also wanted to quickly, quickly mention uh, that I know it's not the appropriate time now, but I, I, I just wanted to say quickly that we worked with uh, the mayor to find a Christmas village cottage to dedicate it to following officers uh, that we can display uh, uh, at Christmas Village. And uh, they found uh, uh, one cottage that is available uh, to, to do that. So if there's any way, Chair, that maybe, if this could be a part of a, a conversation that maybe we can have in uh, maybe council business one of these days, I just would really, 
like to see if other council members are interested in coming together and doing this collaboratively and figuring out a way, maybe even to partner with uh, the police department and, 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 and some of uh, whoever wants to partner with us in, 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 in laying out a plan to, to, I think, bring something that I think is gonna be really amazing and beautiful. So, uh, and lastly, I just wanted to thank everyone for, for just uh, the really, I think, uh, amazing uh, relationships, cordial, cordial and kind relationships that we maintain in our, in, our, in our government, even though we don't always agree and uh, we uh, debate and we, and we uh, share our, our, our ideas and beliefs. But I think that we, we're, we're always very respectful and, and we work well together along with the administration. So thank you to everybody for that. Thanks, Councilmember Lopez. And maybe, yeah, maybe we could do an update next week during the work session about the cottage. I don't know what the latest news on that is. Any other comments? Well, just for, for the record, the ball was in my court. Janine oh, did okay. talk to me about it, and I told her that I was going to get back with her, and I never did. That's why I'm very okay. Happy. Yes. I couldn't remember where we were on it, just that we did find the cottage that wasn't being used. So it was, okay. it was me. It was me. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> Great. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah just for a few minutes. At, uh, I, uh, Lu uh, Louise, if I can help in any way, give me a call uh, and see see if I can help you in any way with that project. I think that's a, a great project. Councilmember Nadalski, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think Councilmember Lopez is being modest. He, uh, those were those were his ideas. He deserves uh, support for that. And uh, but I am glad that when he asked for advice and I give my uh, opinion that he listened and I. Uh, I hope that we as a council can take uh, take his ideas uh, seriously and that we can get support from the administration to, to lead by example and uh, provide voluntary and incentive-based options for our community to participate uh, with us. And uh, uh, I'll just, I just wish our uh, uh, community would be more mindful about uh, the times that we're in. Uh, I just feel like it's something that we can never be too mindful of is my point and that uh, uh, that those ideas are things that would add to the to the efforts that have already happened um, that have gotten us far along the road but we can do better and always should do better so appreciate appreciate everybody's support on that <clears throat> thanks any other last comments okay well yeah i appreciate everybody's efforts this evening and I think we've said about all that can be said. Would anybody like to offer a motion to adjourn? So moved. A motion to adjourn by Councilmember. Second. Lopez. Second by Councilmember Lopez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you guys. Have a good night. Oh, I didn't say, is anybody opposed? Anybody want to stay? Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.